Good morning, everyone. You ready to see the world's unhealthiest breakfast? We're gonna start off with a Little Caesars pizza and chase it down with a Red Bull. It's a beautiful morning here in Western Wyoming. It's a little bit cloudy. It rained yesterday as I was driving here. I camped nearby last night. It's about nine o'clock this morning, not especially early. I set my alarm for 6.15 optimistically. Usually I'm pretty good with waking up early, but I was not feeling it this morning, so getting a little bit of a lazy start with a lazy breakfast here. It's beautiful though. I'm excited for today's adventure. I'll talk more about that and tell you more about where I am and what I'm doing once I fuel up here. This river is the main character in today's adventure. This is Gray's River. And it flows some, oh, 80, 100 miles, something like that, through western Wyoming between two mountain ranges. On the right, we have the Salt River Range. On the left, we have the Wyoming Range. You can't really see the, the difference between the two here, but there's a, a big valley that the river has created, and there's a road up that valley. That road is the Grays River Road, and that is what I'll be driving today. I've never done it before, but it's a, an unpaved road, a dirt road the entire way between these two mountain ranges as it follows the river. Should be a really fun adventure today, should be really scenic. The river itself is kind of gross looking right now. Uh, it rained last night, like I said, and so I think that has washed a bunch of sediment into the river. It's off color because of that, I think. I'm about two miles upstream of the mouth of this river. Down this way a couple miles, the Grays River, or Grays River, runs into the Snake River, which is a much more famous western river. So let's go start the adventure there. Let's go take a look at the confluence, and then we'll drive up the road. We'll start driving up the Grays River Road, which goes over here and on this way into the wilderness. And so here we have the Snake River. This little town here is called Alpine. We're basically right on the Wyoming-Idaho border. Alpine is just over the border from Idaho in Wyoming. This is the Snake River, and you can see this, this other colored section, this lighter color. This is the Grays River. I keep saying the Grays. I think it's just Grays River. But this is the water from the river. Isn't that interesting? That off-color water meeting with the water from the Snake River. So this is the mouth of Gray's River. And I wanted to start here because I want to follow this river from its mouth to its source along the Gray's River Road. There's a road here that leads to Jackson and Jackson Hole about 45 minutes this way. But we are heading, like I said, into the, the back country off in this direction. And to give a better idea of where we are exactly and what we're gonna be doing today, Here's the U.S. This is Wyoming. We are way out here, far western Wyoming. And on this map here, it even shows the Wyoming range. So here's Jackson. Grand Teton National Park is right here. Yellowstone is up here. We're going to be driving the length of the Wyoming range. And to get even more specific, here we are on Google Maps. I'm right here. And you can see this line here going through the mountains. That is Gray's River. And these are the two mountain ranges that will be going past. This is the Salt River Range, and this is the Wyoming Range. So let's go ahead and finally commence our journey here along this skinny little cleft between the mountains. Well, I've been driving for about 45 minutes now, gone 20 miles. I've pulled off onto one of the many, 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 many free campsites along this road here. I'm right on the river. It's amazing. This is free camping heaven. This is free camping Mecca here. 
If you're interested in a lifetime's worth of free campsites, come drive this road. I'm only, you know, 20 miles into this drive, but I've passed, I mean, it's gotta be hundreds of campsites, lots and lots and lots and lots of campsites. And the scenery is just incredible. You don't have river views the entire time from the road, but lots of river views, lots of mountain views. As I've gone deeper into the mountains here, the, the views of the mountains on the sides of the, the valley here just get better and the mountains get more impressive. What an awesome place. And it's a really interesting place as far as names go. So one of my favorite things to do when I'm planning a trip is to go to the, the topographical map, the USGS map, and look at the place names and see if there's anything interesting. And here, earlier uh, on this drive, you know, just a few miles in, I passed a creek called Higby Creek. My last name is Higby, and so I thought that was interesting. It was spelled a little bit differently, but uh, there are variations to the spelling. And then just back here, oh, and see what I mean about the mountain views getting better? Anyway, just over here, there's kind of a flat area along the river. It's called Indian Grave Flat. And you wonder, hmm, how did that get its name? What is the story there? Obviously, there was an Indian grave, a Native American grave site over there. It's just really interesting. And then back over here, there's a spot called Grizzly Basin. And I think, okay, what's the encounter that led to that name? Did they just see a grizzly bear off, uh, you know, in the distance grazing in a meadow or or was a guy eaten or attacked? Or did they just stumble across a, a grizzly and it scared them to death while they were out hiking as they went around a corner? You know, stuff like that. It, it makes it makes places like this that can seem kind of not sterile, but you know, it's it's just nature here. There's no story that you're told about a place like this. You kind of have to have to bring your own story, your own definition, your own meaning to a place like this. And when you examine the place names, it gives you a little bit of of ammunition for that it gives you a little bit of of a prompt you know does that make sense anyway just a really interesting place really beautiful area i'm having a great time i come to a place like this and it's like okay i see the appeal of of a camper trailer and this is something that i've actually been thinking about for the last week or two i'd love to build a little trailer a little camper nothing fancy and just tow it back here and just spend a week now use it as a mobile cabin with how many free campsites are here. You could just park your little cabin here and just have a little, little getaway, a little home away from home in the mountains. I love sleeping in the car, but it feels like you're sleeping in a car, you know? And there are pros and cons to that. Pros, it's extremely drivable. It's very nimble. I can go anywhere quickly at the, the drop of a hat, but it doesn't feel like like a cozy little home. And even if I were to add wood paneling or something to the inside of the Land Cruiser here, it, it wouldn't feel like that. But having a little cabin, little camper, that's something I'm thinking about. Let me know if that's something that you would be interested in seeing, seeing me build something like that for, I don't know, a few thousand dollars. Let's get back on the road. I'm excited. 20 miles in, I have 50 or 60 to go. I don't know how long the course of the river is. You know, the river, of course, meanders. Uh, I'm guessing it's got to be at least 100 miles. I think the dirt road section that I'm driving today is around 80 miles, but we'll see. So after about 16 and a half more miles of driving on the road along Gray's River, which is this, by the way, this is Gray's River, much smaller and shallower than it was 30 miles down below. That's to be expected, of course. Anyway, drove another 16 miles and turned right onto a little side road, which is what I'm on now. And I'm going to drive another three miles up this road and then we're going to go on a little hike.
Well, it's raining and hailing now. I'm taking shelter under a small pine tree. I didn't bring a jacket, stupidly. I didn't pack one. I might have a poncho in my little emergency pouch, my little emergency bag that I always have with me in my backpack. Let's see. This thing. I know you can't really see much, it's just like dark and probably out of focus, but I'm working with what I've got here. Well, I have a space blanket. Looks like I do not have a poncho. Man, that was stupid. Why didn't I pack my jacket? The weather's been fine. It was fine until it wasn't. Okay guys, tree update number two. Different tree this time. So let's see if I can get a better angle for you guys without the camera getting wet. Uh, it's still raining. Well, okay, so I spent about 20 minutes underneath the first series of trees. I kept trying to find a better tree to shelter under. It was kind of miserable. I got wet. Not as wet as I would have been out in the open, but I'm still pretty wet right now. The rain led up. I hiked about 15 minutes up the trail to my destination. I'm at the destination now, but it's raining again. Uh, luckily, there's a giant tree here that's providing quite a bit of shelter. Uh, I think it might ease up soon. I can see some blue sky off in the horizon. I guess uh, let me go out to a different tree and I'll show you what I can see from the shelter of, of the trees here. I'm at this beautiful lake it's called Lake Barstow. Beautiful mountain backdrop here. But it's just raining a lot. I came to this lake because it's one of the more accessible lakes in this area. Okay, back under big tree here now, but the hike here is only about a mile and a half. Wasn't too bad. Kind of steep in some places, but overall pleasant enough little hike. The, the trail was super muddy once I left that first tree hiding location and pretty hard to, to walk on, but we're doing our best here. I also wanted to come to this particular lake because it's supposed to be extremely clear. Like you can see the fish in there. One person online called it an aquarium. And so that sounded pretty neat. Unfortunately, with the rain, I definitely can't see any fish. With the overcast weather, it's harder to see fish. It's easier to see fish when the water is, or when the sky is clear and when it's sunny and when there's no wind. And so with all those things against me here, I don't think we'll be able to, to see any fish, unsurprisingly, but still a beautiful place. And uh, you know, I wanted to fly the drone over the lake and everything, I have that with me, but the weather is just not quite cooperating today. I'll sit it out for another 15 or 20 minutes. We'll see if we can't get some clear conditions. Otherwise, pretty lake, worth doing, but probably best enjoyed in clear weather. All right, about 15 minutes later, it has mostly, I think, blown over. It still kind of feels like it's raining because the, the forest here, the trees are still all dripping. And I can hear that, so in my mind it still kind of feels like it's raining. But um, I don't see any more drops on the surface of the lake, so let's fly the drone. And now another 15 miles up the road, up the river. I'm at a bridge that crosses Gray's River and I wanted to show you the size of it now, kind of check in every 10 or 15 miles or so. Really, it's just a creek here. I mean, the deepest spot that I can see in through here, I mean, maybe this is a foot deep and it's less than that all through here. So just a creek, basically, a little mountain creek. 
Definitely not the big off-colored river that we saw down low. Still beautiful though, still a beautiful area. Behind me and behind the car, this high mountain ridge here, this is the, the highest ridge in the Wyoming range, in the mountain range. I don't know which one of these is Wyoming Peak, which is the highest in the range. It's somewhere, I think it might be hidden from view over here somewhere, but just beautiful country. Again, tons and tons of campsites around here. You could spend a lifetime camping along this river and still not camp in all of the campsites. It's, it's awesome. What a cool place. What a beautiful area. Fun drive. The road is great. Uh, mostly. It's, I think any car can, can drive this road. There are just some little like potholes and some washboarded sections. There's nothing that needs high clearance, nothing that needs four wheel drive. My RAV4 could have done this just fine. And uh, I think even a sedan could drive this road. Um, it's getting late though. It's almost five o'clock. I'm gonna be driving into the dark tonight, which I don't like doing. I've been taking my time and exploring little side places, checking out different campsites, and um, that's costing me, <laughs> costing me time. It's great, but I probably should have spent two or three days up here instead of just the one day. So we're gonna hurry through here and uh, try to get to the next spot. Well, it's not gonna be before dark, but try to get to the next spot sometime before midnight tonight. And I'm in the next spot after this immediate area. There's still things that I wanna see and do around here, but uh, then I'm gonna be camping a few hours away. Anyway, let's go on to the next spot in this immediate area. I'm another couple miles up the road now and I figured it would be a good spot to stop and show you the, the state of the river. It's literally, I mean, two, three feet wide here. And very off color from the rain. I could jump across this easily. From humble beginnings, right? Uh, the river does, I think there's another mile or so until we get to the actual source of the river. I think ostensibly the source is a spring somewhere up here. I'll try to find it, but usually those things are pretty hard to find, but we'll see. We'll see what we can do. Let's drive another mile up the road and see if we can find anything. So about five miles down river, we stopped at that bridge and it was like a small creek. The river was like a small creek there. Here it fits under the road in this little culvert. Here's the up river side, and here's the down river side. And one thing that I didn't realize was here was this sign. It says, Gray's River, watch me grow. And that is right by the, uh, the culvert right here. This is the first time I've ever followed a river for its entire length, and it's kind of emotional seeing it like this, just this little, this little guy right here. You know, I've, I haven't seen it grow. I've seen it, you know, go in reverse, but same kind of thing. Like I've seen what it can become. I've seen its potential and I'm kind of proud of it. I want to, you know, encourage it to, to keep flowing. And what a fun little adventure here. And just past this spot, not far at all. I think it's just over here there's a, a pass or a, a divide, and that's gonna be our next stop. Okay, that wasn't much of a drive. It was literally the spot that I pointed to. I could have walked there. But anyway, there is a sign here saying Tri-Basin Divide, and it's called that because rivers flow into three different areas from here. To the left here, we have the Colorado River, which flows into the Gulf of California. And then I think it's a mile or two over this way, like on the other side of this mountain, we have rivers that flow into the Great Basin. The waters there don't flow into any ocean. Uh, that's why it's called the Great Basin. They just flow into the Great Salt Lake or they evaporate or whatever. And then the Columbia River is off this way. So the Grays River headwaters, the, the source is just right here. And Grays River flows into the Snake River, which we saw this morning, we saw the confluence where the Grays River flows into the, the larger Snake River. And then the Snake River flows into the Columbia River. The Columbia River, of course, flows into the Pacific Ocean. And so in this very 
small geographical area. We have waters that flow into three completely different areas. Very interesting. And uh, really great views too. Looking off in the direction I'm headed, we have some more pretty mountain views here. Also, one thing that I didn't mention about the three different watersheds is that over the millennia, the trout in each of those rivers and each of those watersheds has evolved to become a separate subspecies. So in the Grays River uh, area, that has the Snake River fine spotted cutthroat trout, which is one subspecies of cutthroat trout. In the other direction, the direction that I'm headed, that has Colorado River cutthroat trout. And then over there in the Great Basin, that has Bonneville cutthroat trout. It's interesting how you know, they're all, uh, at one time they were all the same species, but they've evolved to become different. And it's just very, very interesting. What a, what a beautiful, interesting spot. And uh, the interesting things will continue. We have some historical things coming up. So just off this direction, again, in the Colorado River watershed over here, we actually have some Oregon Trail history. So let's go check that out. And so here we have this spot called Labarge Meadow, a large open meadow, tons of cattle grazing in here. The creek that flows through this area is called Labarge Creek, which I actually have fished before. I have been in this area before. I've never been to the, the Grays River area, but I have been here before. And the Lander Cutoff used to go through this area. So basically this road that I've been following uh, and if I were to continue following it over this way, we'd go over another pass. And anyway, through this area went the Lander Cutoff, which was a variation of the Oregon Trail established in 1859. And they wanted a variation like this because it was much more, there was much more water here than there was further to the south where it was more deserty. And so here was a just a nice, fertile, watery area. And it was much easier for the people, much easier for the livestock. And uh, there's a sign here talking about the meadow and the cutoff. And it says in 1859, which was the first year of use, over 13,000 immigrants and 79,000 head of stock passed through here. And the meadow here was a popular resting spot. I mean, you can see why it's a beautiful area, lots of water, lots of grass for the animals. Popular resting spot before going over the, the final pass, which was just over this way. And the Lander Cutoff here was actually a government funded route. Like the, they sent out surveyors and they, they found this spot and the government funded the establishment of the road through here to make it easier for the immigrants, for the pioneers. And further downstream off in this direction, we have a few things to see relating to some of those pioneers, some of those immigrants. And of course, when you have tens of thousands of people doing anything, but especially something dangerous like traveling thousands of miles across the continent, not everyone is going to make it. I think the figure I read about this, uh, the lander cutoff, is that one in ten people died. And so there is some evidence of that along the way here that we can see. This tree here has a little wooden fence around it, and that's because it is a grave site. So a woman named Elizabeth Paul died here giving birth in 1862. We have a, a marker here. This is a more modern marker. And then according to this, this sign over here, which I'm, I'll take a picture of and I'll put a, a link to that down below if you want to read all about her. But uh, apparently she was 32 years old and they took a, a little wooden board, wrote her name on it and stuck it in the, the notch of this tree here. What a sad thing. This is the original tree, by the way, that she was buried under. Same tree, just a hundred and however many years later. And uh, there was a, a fence here originally. When they buried her, they put that, that plank in uh, the notch in the tree. Then they also built a little white picket fence around the grave. And uh, the baby that she gave birth to survived a week. And then uh, the baby also passed away. The husband and the, I think, seven surviving uh, remaining children did make it to uh, to Oregon Territory. I think they settled in Washington and uh, the widower lived to be 75 years old. And about five miles away down the road we have another grave marker here. This one just says unknown Oregon Trail dead. And I think there are a couple more 
on the hillside right here. Yep, sure enough, two more graves here. I believe these ones do have names on them, but I can't really get close enough to read them. There's another sign over here. I don't know what it says, but I'm walking over toward that. And, uh, you know, seeing that first grave, the Elizabeth Paul grave, put me in a little bit of a somber mood. My dad just passed away a little less than two months ago. I haven't mentioned that here on the channel. I have mentioned it in one or two Adventure Know How bonus videos. And I remembered that I haven't told you guys that I'm not going to Alaska this year. Uh, dad had brain cancer. He had a, a glioblastoma, a brain tumor. And I was able to spend quite a bit of time with mom and dad uh, in the couple of months before dad died. But because I was spending a lot of time doing that, it kind of push my whole travel schedule back and that took up a lot of time and um, I just don't have the the time to go to Alaska this year. Hopefully I can still make it up to Canada. I might do one or two quick trips up to Canada. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, Alaska will have to wait for another year. So we have another land or cutoff sign here. It says at this point the pioneers began their ascent of the mountains. So that would have been off in this direction I think having traveled 106 miles since leaving the main road. The graves nearby are those of immigrants left behind as a result of hardships, accidents, and disease. Death was a frequent visitor to the wagon trains. I'll talk more about Dad in a future video. He loved these videos. He was a huge supporter of my adventures and uh, basically my adventuring nature, my adventuring, uh, my adventurous spirit comes directly from him. So I'll talk about that more in the future for now. I've got a lot of driving to do. I think this is the last stop that I wanted to make here. From here I'm going to head out of the mountains, going to drive two or three hours east, and uh, I think, yeah, I think it'll be dark by the time I find a campsite, but I'll, uh, I'll meet back up with you once I get to camp. And also, one thing that I wanted to mention, uh, earlier in the video I talked about possibly making a little travel trailer, a little camper, and uh, that wouldn't really be featured much on this channel. I still love sleeping in my car, in my SUVs, but uh, I was thinking that like, it would be sort of a, a mobile fishing cabin. So for example, what we just drove through today, the Grays River area, tons and tons of fishing there, as you might expect, both in the main river and then with, it's gotta be like a hundred little side streams coming in. I've been thinking it would be nice to pull a trailer there, leave it parked there for three, four, five days, a week, whatever, and just fish different spots and come back to a nice little warm mobile cabin at night. So if you're worried about the, the channel turning into a travel trailer camper channel, it wouldn't be that. It would be mostly a fishing thing, but I think it'd be a fun thing to show uh, how I built and uh, show you guys the, the finished result here on the channel. So again, let me know if that's something that you're interested in. But again, <laughs> lots of talking here. I'm gonna get back in the car, head out of the mountains. And I'll see you guys at camp. All right, guys, it's about 9.30. I'm tired. I'm going to make this kind of quick, but there were a few things I wanted to add to the video here. So first of all, I am at a campsite, but it's dark, so I can't really show it to you. Maybe if I leave in the morning, uh, if there's a little bit of light, maybe I can get a, a picture or, or show you what it's like here. And also, there were a couple of sections on the road today where an SUV would have been helpful. Uh, mostly the road is really good, but there were some rocky sections and some sections that were kind of washed out. And so... I would do it in an SUV. Uh, I wouldn't take a, like a Corolla, but basically any car that's bigger than that should should be okay. Overall, it's a surprisingly good road. And then one thing that I wanted to mention about the area has to do with a quote that I read about it, about the, that whole Grays River corridor. And they said that it was wild beyond belief. I thought that was a really cool way of describing it. And I think that captures that area pretty well. Now, obviously it's not like super super wild because there's a road <laughs> going through it but as far as places with roads go it's pretty great and i hope some of the the beauty and kind of the the rawness of the area came through in the video today and uh, i highly suggest that if you liked what you saw in the video that you drive that road it's doable and uh, i think you'll really enjoy it like i did and i hope you guys really enjoyed the video thanks for watching let me know what you think let me know if you have any questions let me know what your favorite part is, and I'll see you in the next one. Be sure to check out Adventure Know How, my new site, where you can gain access to a map of all of my free campsites, plus monthly bonus videos that you won't find anywhere else. 
Learn more at adventureknowhow.com. And for links to everything else SUV RVing related, visit suvrving.com. Links to these sites and more will be in the video description.